we notice something really interesting as soon as you start reciting from any juz of the Quran, you come across certain themes that are repeated. And amongst the themes that are repeated throughout the Quran and not discussed often enough are the promises of Allah. The promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran come in different forms. Sometimes they are explicit and direct. You'll notice the word wa'ad or wa'ad Allah or al wa'id And other times you'll notice that the promise is implied. It is stated without the word wa'ad such as وَمَا أَنْفَقْتُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَهُوَ يُخْلِفُ Whatever you give in charity, Allah will replace it and also bless you for it. And it's really interesting for us to explore this question of our interaction with the Qur'an in light of these promises. Because some studies have found, some studies conducted by Muslims, they found that the more a Muslim engages with the Qur'an, and specifically the ayat that have promises, there are promises of all types in the Qur'an, we'll cover some today inshallah, that there is almost instantaneously an increase in motivation, resilience, perseverance. And with that, when you have that increased motivation, you are much more likely to also have more righteous actions. But all of this goes back to what? How often you connect with the Qur'an. One time I was speaking to a number of students just a few months ago, and I asked the students to open up their Qur'an apps or a mushaf, and to start reading from any surah of the Qur'an and to stop as soon as they came across a promise of Allah. And almost everyone in the class stopped within the first two minutes because the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are repeated in so many different forms in so many different places. But I want us to think about what it does for us in terms of increasing your iman, in terms of your mental health, in terms of your optimism and happiness. And to ask yourself about all the times in your life in which you had a personal experience with dua being answered or barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or something in particular that maybe you did not pay attention to and you think about the example of the companions why was their iman so high? why were they so strong in their faith? especially the early Muslims who witnessed so many different promises coming true at that time imagine the first few years of prophethood the Muslims are persecuted they boycott is taking place, the boycott is complete, you cannot buy and sell, you cannot access anything at all, and they're starving. Some of them thought they would starve to death. The persecution was at an all-time high at that point in Mecca. And they were receiving revelation still, it was coming down, receiving promises from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And amongst the most interesting is the promise that the believers would be successful at the upcoming battle that the pagans of Quraysh that are attacking the Muslims, that they would be defeated soon. How? The Muslims are small in number. They have no military, they have nothing. They're wondering how is this going to happen? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this promise, but before He makes this promise, there's an address to the disbelievers, a reminder. Do you remember the people of Fir'aun? That they rejected the truth when it came to them? Do you remember they rejected the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So Allah took them with a mighty seizing, a mighty power, a mighty punishment. And in addition to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the people of Quraysh, أَكُفَّارُكُمْ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ أُولَٰئِكُمْ أَمْ لَكُمْ بَرَاءَةٌ فِي الزُّبُرِ Do you think, you disbelievers, are you better than the people who rejected the truth and they were already destroyed? Or do you have some kind of uh, protection that's granted for you in the previous scriptures? Is there something you think will protect you on this day? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, and this continues with the threat which leads to the promise, أَمْ يَقُولُونَ نَحْنُ جَمِيعٌ مُنْتَصِرٌ Are they saying that we are basically going to prevail? That we will unite and prevail over the Muslims because they are small in number? Because they do not have power? And here's the promise. سَيُهْزَمُ الْجَمْعُ وَيُوَلُّونَ الدُّبَرُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they will soon, basically their united group will be disconnected, they will be divided, they will be defeated, they will be running. They will be running scared. They will be churning and fleeing, meaning there will be a battle soon. This was revealed, according to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, seven years before the Battle of Badr. Aisha radiallahu anh says this was revealed in Mecca five years before they migrated. Umar radiallahu anhu, he said when this ayah came down and we were reciting the Qur'an, remember the Sahaba were experiencing live revelation like they were hearing ayat 
as they were being taught to them and they were wondering what is this referring to? And the Prophet ﷺ would have to explain it to them. So he asked, he wondered, what's that group, al jam that's going to be running? What is that group? And then he said, on the day of the battle of Badr, when the pagan Qurayshis were fleeing from the battle, when they were being defeated, I saw the Prophet ﷺ in his armor as he was rushing forward, he was reciting this ayah, He said, only then did I realize that this is the defeat that had been foretold. Some of the Sahaba were talking about how there was a fear that the, the disbelievers were attacking, the persecution was really severe. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, he says that this was revealed before and that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to a number of companions, as he's leaving the tent on the day of the battle of Badr, he was making so much dua to the extent that Abu Bakr radiallahu an, took him by the hand and he said, Ya Rasulullah, you've made dua pressingly, meaning so much dua. It's time to go, meaning it's time to head out. We need to start the battle. We need to go and defend. So it's time to go. We've made so much dua. The Prophet ﷺ went out wearing his armor, reciting, الدبر. It's as though the Prophet ﷺ, obviously, he knows what the promise is about. He's repeating it over and over and over. And he made dua and said, Ya Allah, your promise, your covenant, Ya Allah. The night before this battle, Umar radiallahu an. He says, and this is, by the way, for those who don't know, the Battle of Badr, one of the most decisive battles in Islamic history, when you had less than 315 believers and over a thousand of the pagan Qurayshis, the Prophet wasallam showed the companions the night before in the battlefield, showed them on the ground, this is where so and so will die tomorrow, amongst the enemies who will attack us. This is where so and so will die tomorrow, inshallah. This is where so and so will die tomorrow, inshallah. And Umar radiallahu an, he said, by the one, I swear by the one who sent him with the truth, meaning he's swearing by Allah, none of the enemies at the battle of Badr fell except in the exact spot where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam had mentioned. I want you to imagine, those who participate in the Battle of Badr and their Iman was so high, you know they have their own status uh, in history and theologically they have their own status because of what they went through, because of how difficult it was with a small number of believers and it was the first major battle when they migrated to Medina. I want you to imagine their faith. Do you think they ever doubted after that battle, after what they saw and the foretelling of this victory? Do you think they ever doubted again? that they recite an ayah of the Qur'an or they heard that your dua is mustajab or that your sadaqah does not affect your wealth. Do you think they ever doubted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise? Absolutely not. And the question for us should be, although we did not witness the battle of Badr, it should be with the experiences that you've had in your life and what you've put forth towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fulfilling the right of Allah. Have you noticed in yourself enough of an experience to say, I know with no doubt whatsoever that the promise of Allah is always true? Do you know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is? Do we know Allah based on his description, based on his names and his attributes? Because the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, used to do the opposite. They used to hear about the revelation and they would react in the opposite way. They would say, ما وعدنا الله ورسوله إلا غرورا. Allah and His Messenger did not promise us except deceptions. They were trying to shake the faith of believers. So they were lying and they themselves had no faith. The believers are the opposite. We read the Qur'an and when you come across and the next time you read the Qur'an, maybe pay a little more attention to promises of Allah. When you come across a promise, ask yourself how much you are engaged with it. How much you are living upon it. How much do you believe in it? What are some examples of that? If we were to list them, perhaps we'd be here for another two or three hours. But just a few examples from the Quran about the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ Remember me, I will remember you. Some of the Mufassirun used to say, this is one of the most commented on verses of the entire Quran throughout history. Remember me, I will remember you. Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, he said it means remember me by obeying me. And I will remember you, and there are many meanings for this. I will protect you. I will mention you in a greater gathering. As you mention Allah with your family, with your friends, with your community, when you seek knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions your name in the heavens. Remember me, I will protect you. I will guide you. I will bless you. I will forgive you. I will relieve you of your hardships. But how often do we remember Allah? And the remembrance of Allah is not only dhikr on the tongue. The remembrance of Allah is also thinking about Allah, referencing Him. 
When something happens in your life, when you're doing anything, when you start your day, when you're working, when you're about to sleep, when you're with your family, whatever you're doing, you're always referencing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The believer who remembers Allah often is the one who's frequently saying, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, on the right and proper occasions. The believer is the one who does not shy away from remembering Allah often, even if the people around are confused. Why are you making so much dhikr and dua? SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. There's a promise of Allah that He will bless you in other words, that He will be there for you. When you call upon Him, the dua is mustajab, even quicker than you expect. In addition to this, similar to this, the second promise as an example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu in tansuru Allah yansurukum wa yuthabbit aqdamakum. O you who believe, O believers, so pay attention when you hear, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu. If you support the religion of Allah, if you support the revelation of Allah, if you support Islam, if you support the rights of Allah, Allah will support you. Similar to the first promise, but here the emphasis is on Nasr. There's an emphasis on support, on victory, on the state of the ummah, on the state of the individual, on the one who's oppressed. Do we really support the rights of Allah? When we look at society and we criticize what's happening of the loss of morality, and we t teach our children this is right and this is wrong, this is important, no doubt. But are we really living behind closed doors, supporting the religion of Allah and in public as well? And are we proud of that or are we ashamed of it? Do we teach others? Do we share with others? Are we proud Muslims in a society that oftentimes does not really know Islam? To support Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion is to support it in the teachings. To support it in terms of your character with your family, that you have good character with your neighbors, with your spouse, your parents, your children. To support the religion of Allah is for you to prioritize it over your own desires. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who support the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah forgive us for all of our shortcomings. Remember this though, the religion of Allah is not in need of our defense. We are in need of defending it. The religion of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of us defending him. We are in need of supporting the truth. And the, the action here starts with us in Tansurullah. If you start that action of prioritizing Islam in your life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you support. We frequently talk about the state of the ummah and the hardships that are afflicting the ummah in our particular time and throughout history as well. And it's important for us to think of our individual responsibility and how it affects the rest of the ummah. If we ourselves are always shifting the blame and thinking somebody else will take care of the ummah, somebody else is going to take care of this problem, then who's going to take care of the problem? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and guide us. Number three, another example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you are to thank me, I will increase you in blessings. And one of the biggest tests of life is when someone has a life of ease, Allah gave you blessings, Allah gave you rizq, you have generally relative ease in your life compared to others around the world or others in this country, and you are not grateful to Allah. So you're killing your time, you're extravagant with your wealth, you're burning your money on useless things, you're not really worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you know, as you have a particular standard of knowledge. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us about gratitude here. Gratitude entails everything that Allah gave you, you're using it in the best manner possible, including and starting with your life, your time, your health. That, Ya Allah, I am worshipping you because you created me. I'm worshipping you out of gratitude. in kafartum inna adabi lashadid. And if you reject that blessing, the kufr here is the rejection of the blessing of Allah, then know that the punishment of Allah is severe. In other words, there's a promise here about reward and blessings in this life and the next, and there's a promise as well about punishment for that shortcoming. Let us be grateful. Let us be grateful with the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us and we will see the blessings of that. Number four, another promise of Allah is that if you seek forgiveness regularly, you're always asking Allah to forgive you whether for a specific sin or in a general sense, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh, I seek forgiveness from Allah. If you do this as a habit and a lifestyle, and it is a lifestyle for the believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises you rizq in this life as well. Sometimes we think we're not supposed to search for and seek the provisions of this world, but if you think about the effects of sins and how they cause corruption in the world and oppression and harm and suffering, we realize the opposite is true. Sometimes you may be trying to get to a particular thing in your life and you've tried for years. But because you refuse to give up on a particular sin, that blessing, you are prevented from it. 
And this is what the Prophet ﷺ teaches us. So as you're seeking more blessings from Allah, do so in order to get closer to Him, not in order to become more sinful and disobedient. One time a brother in one of our communities, he said, I used to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make me a millionaire. And then he said, I started to realize, he had a, a good source of income, mashallah. He said, I started to realize in my current state, I wasn't grateful to Allah as it was. So how do I know with more money I'm going to be a greater and more devout believer? Sometimes the thing you're asking for is not to get you closer to Allah. So if you're asking for something of a dunya, and it should be the minority, not the majority of the dua, but as you're asking for things of a dunya, and you should, make sure you're asking in order to get closer to Allah. That, Ya Allah, I'm asking you for this thing so I can help more people, so that I can get closer to you, so that I can be more humble. Not so that we are more extravagant and wasteful and killing the environment and wasting other people's potential. No, so that we are closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا To the end of these ayat in Surah Nuh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in this story of Nuh alayhi salam, He's saying, seek forgiveness from Allah. He is the oft forgiving if you do so. Allah will bring down to you the rain in abundance. He will grant you an abundance of this and children and rivers and gardens. In other words, seek forgiveness from Allah and you will notice the ease and the relief that comes with it. We have seen from many of our sisters and our brothers in this community and around the country and around the world, so many personal stories they've shared in which they started living a lifestyle of more tawbah and istighfar and almost immediately after that, they started noticing more rizq or a way out of a difficult situation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst al-mustaghfirin. Allahumma ameen. Number five, there's a promise that no matter how bad your past was, no matter how many sins you committed yesterday, no matter what type of sin it was, that if you sincerely return to Allah, sincerely repent to Allah, that Allah will forgive you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us at the end of Surah Al-Furqan a number of different examples about sins that people commit. To the end of the ayah, and Allah mentions a punishment for the people who commit zina and the people who commit shirk. And that punishment is emphasized. It's a frightening punishment and it is a promise. But right after that, there's another promise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا مَن تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَّحِيمًا Except for those who repent to Allah and they believe in Allah and they do good deeds to make up for that lifestyle, to make up for that sin. Allah promises to replace the sins with good deeds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is oft forgiving. These promises, by the way, of tawbah and forgiveness in the Quran are mentioned throughout. We have so many examples of that. The question is, are we taking action today to repent? Or do we delay for a day that is not guaranteed? Just this morning, I heard from one of the mashayikh. He's living in another country, but he shared this personal story. And it just happened over the last week. He said, a young man had his friend, his friend was not practicing. He was not praying. Salah is the first thing you'll be asked about on the day of judgment. It is your shield and your guarantee. So he would always tell his friend to pray. And his friend would say, inshallah, one day I'll start. He knows it's an obligation. He's not rejecting the obligation of salah. But he's simply not doing it. Inshallah, one day I'll pray. Inshallah, one day I'll pray. Every now and then he'll remind his friend. 25 years old. And this last week, just this last week, his friend responded back to him, Inshallah, this Saturday, khalas, this weekend, this Saturday, I'm going to start praying. And he passed away on that Saturday. They prayed janazah on him, and his friend was one of the people who buried him. He said, I have been telling him to pray for a long time. So what are you waiting for? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to turn to him today. Why are we delaying for a day that is not guaranteed? When we know one of the promises of Allah is that when death comes to us, there is no delay. So be ready for that moment by doing what you want to see in your record on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and accept from us. Allahumma ameen. Another of the promises of Allah. He says, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call upon me, I will respond to you. Wa salaka ibadi anni fa inni qareeb. I am nearby if my servants ask about me. Ujibu da'wata da'i idha da'an. I respond to the one who calls upon me when they call upon me. A brother one time called me and he said, I have been making dua for 10 years and I'm very angry and frustrated. Why is my dua not accepted? 
And then shortly after this, we talked for a while, shortly after this, he sent another message. He said, and this happens a lot, by the way, this is a very common thing people misunderstand about dua. He said, I feel so bad for getting angry. I know I was wrong. I know it's from shaitan. I feel so bad, so I just wanted to correct what I said in front of you. Don't we know the promise that the believer who makes dua, as long as the heart is attentive, your heart is sincere, you believe that the dua is accepted, that it's accepted in different forms, don't we already know this promise through the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? As long as you're not asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for something haram, your dua is accepted. Do you believe in the promise of Allah or do you doubt? And how much effort do we put in dua as well? Sometimes the dua could have been answered but you gave up and you were very hasty. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, that a man was very rushed. You're expecting Allah to give it to you on your terms, at your time, at your pace. When Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows what's better for you. The dua that you make is answered so long it is not for something haram like cutting off family ties or for a sin or something harmful to you that you think you want. The dua could be answered by protecting you from some kind of calamity, which you can't see. You don't know that the dua you've been making for something else for 10 years was protecting you from another problem. Your dua can also be accepted in a better form at a different time, in a manner that is better for you as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al alim or your dua could be saved for you as mountains of rewards on the day of judgment. So you will come on the most important day of your life, hoping that there's something that will help you and you'll find all these hasanat. That was the dua you were making and you did not give up on it. Do not give up on your dua. Do not belittle the power of dua. Do not undermine the effect of dua even for your brothers and your sisters around the world. Just because there's still oppression and dhulm does not mean your dua doesn't matter. In fact, the minimum standard for the believer is to always be making sincere dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who believe in His promise. Allahumma ameen. And on that note, there's no doubt whatsoever. Many people here, perhaps every single one of us in a different form, has experienced when you sincerely make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some good comes out of it. Sometimes you will see it in the form that you asked for. Sometimes you'll notice it in the blessing through your children or your family or something else. But do not give up on your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through dua. Another promise of Allah is that when you give charity, you don't lose anything. When you give charity, He replaces it. And it's a loan. Allah gave you a loan, you used it for something wise. Another of the promises of Allah, if you live righteously, men or women, as Allah says in the Quran, we'll grant them a good life. A good life here means many things, but amongst them is the peace of the heart that you get through iman that you cannot get from anywhere else. Hayat and tayyibah can also mean protection against certain things in this life and generally a blessed life. For those who are misguided and those who are astray and those who are looking to become better believers, Allah promises, Those who put in effort to be guided, you put in the hard work, you pray, you fast, you do what you're supposed to do, Allah promises He will reinforce your guidance, and he will increase you in taqwa as well. About and regarding those who are oppressed, every time you turn on the news, you see what's happening today in Palestine and has been happening for 70 years, and you see what's happening in many countries, and here in this country as well, when you hear about a mass shooting, when you hear about police brutality, when you hear about specific things, and you say, I wish there was some justice, I wish something could change, and you have to put in, obviously, your effort. But don't forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a promise about that as well. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ إِنَّمَا يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ Do not assume Allah is unaware of what oppressors do. He's saving them for a day in which their eyes will be staring in horror. Later on, after talking about their punishment in Surah Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes what they're going to be punished with and what they respond with on the Day of Judgment. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us once again, فَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ مُخْلِفَ وَعْدِهِ رُسُلَ Do not assume that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will break His promise to His messengers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not break His promise. وَعْدَ اللَّهَ لَا يُخْلِفُ اللَّهُ وَعْدَ In Surah Al-Rum, another of the promises is that the Qur'an will be preserved. Previous nations of the people of the book and the people before them, they were given the responsibility of preserving the text and they lost it. They corrupted it for many reasons beyond the scope of this khutbah. But when it came to the final message, there was a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that all people can access the message of Allah in a timeless manner until the end of times after the final messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Qur'an would be preserved. This is a promise that we have studied and seen historically and theologically. And then you fast forward to the akhirah and you know what it is. The promise of Jannah. The promise of reward. 
the promise of being with one's family in the highest levels of Jannah. The promise that your descendants who follow you in faith will be with you in Jannah as well, as mentioned in Surah At-Tur. The promise of the believers who do certain things being in the higher levels. Al-Firdaus, ulaika humul warithun. And the promise of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are so many other promises mentioned in the Quran. But at the end of the day, are we engaged with these promises in a way that is reflected in our daily lives? Do we really wake up every day living lifestyles of those who believe in the promise of Allah? And if we feel like we have room for improvement, let us connect to the Quran. Let us recite it more often in proportion to how much we want our iman and our happiness to increase. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and guide us, increase us in goodness, and make us amongst those who trust in His promise at all times and places. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfiru wa liulakum fa astaghfiru. Innahu huwa al-ghafuru rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. If we were to summarize everything about what we said and much more that we could not share today, read the Qur'an in greater proportions and read the Qur'an while focusing on the theme of the promises of Allah. And pause when you get to an ayah in which there's a promise that you will see this, you will see that, this will happen, that will happen. Pause and reflect on what it's doing for you, on what you're taking from it on what habits you might finally be able to change, on what you might be able to do to progress towards Allah, or the effect that it has on your mental state, how much happier it makes you, according to a number of Muslim psychologists. And so let us engage with the Qur'an on a greater, uh, or with a greater uh, quantity, inshallah. The second, when you do recite the Qur'an, and you come across one of these promises, ask yourself if you are implementing it. The promise of charity, the promise of dua, are you making dua? Or you have strayed away because you don't really 100% believe that your dua is mustajab. You have a slight doubt or many doubts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So let us engage with the Qur'an in proportion to how much happiness we desire and how much we believe in the promise of Allah. Even though we did not see the battle of Badr, we did not see the believers successful and rejoicing. We did not see the Romans rebounding with victory over the Persians. We did not see all the different promises come true at that time, but we see promises coming true now with the spread of Islam and the dua that is mustajab and the many other promises we all experience in different forms in our daily lives. Let us engage with it and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us consistent in calling upon Him knowing that the promise of Allah is always true.